If you've been following along with the lessons so far, you've probably noticed that we've kind of been avoiding limits of trigonometric functions. And that was intentional because I was saving them for this lesson because there's some extra techniques and extra ways to evaluate limits that have functions composed of trigonometric functions. So we'll just get right to it. And there are two special trig limits that you need to know that are going to be very helpful in evaluating limits with trig functions in them. So we have our first one, which is the limit as x approaches zero of sine x over x is equal to one. And then our second one is the limit as x approaches zero of one minus cosine x over x equals zero. These two limits are very important because they're going to show up a lot in different limits that involve trig functions. And while I'm typically not a fan of just giving equations and not really telling you where they come from, the proofs for these two limits are a little bit involved and use geometry and some math that I don't think is really necessary for the purposes of this course. So you have to sort of take my word for it, but I still want to show you in some way that these limits are true. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to plug in numbers close to zero and show you that as we get closer to zero, we do reach the values that each of these limits equal. And the reason why we even have to do that in the first place is because if you were to plug in zero into these functions right now, you would get an undefined value because of that x in the denominator. So if I were to plug in 0 0.1 as my value of x into this equation up here, then I would get 0 0.99833. And that is using a calculator, of course. I didn't just do that in my head. And then similarly, if we plug in 0 0.05, which is half of what we put in before, so we're getting closer to zero, we're gonna find that our value is 0 0.99958. And then if we plug in 0 0.025, which is even smaller, we're even closer to zero, we took another half of the last value we plugged in, we will find that we're at 0 0.9998. Eight, nine. So with each iteration, we are getting closer and closer to one. You can see that this number is closer to one than this one because of this nine over this eight. And this number is closer to one than this number because nine, 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 eight, nine instead of five, eight. So as we would get closer and closer to zero, we would find that we are approaching one. And the same would be true for negative values as well because this limit is a limit that is going from both sides. So I'm gonna save you time by not showing you the negative values, but maybe if you wanna try it for yourself, you can plug those in and see that it's also true. And then we can do the same thing for our second limit, one minus cosine x over x. As we plug in these smaller values, we will find ourselves getting closer to zero. So if I put in 0 0.1, we'll find that I have 0 0.049958. For 0 0.05, we'll find ourselves at 0 0.02499. And for 0 0.025, we will be at 0 0.012499. So once again, we see that we are getting closer and closer to zero in this case, right? Because this one equaled one, we were getting closer to one, but this limit is equal to zero. And you'll see we're getting closer to zero because the number is getting smaller with each iteration. So that's kind of a bit of a visual way to see why these two limits are true. It's also important to note that this x value here can look a little different than it does in this form right here. This is the most basic form. However, if we had a limit, let's say the limit as x approaches zero of sine two x over two x, that would also be equal to one. And if you wanna quick see why that's true, if we set two x equal to y, and then we took the limit of that function as we approached y, we'll find it's quite the same. So if I plug that in, we'll have the limit as y approaches zero of sine of y over y. Well, it doesn't matter what this variable is, whether it's x or y, it's the same variable and we're approaching zero for that variable. It doesn't matter, so that would just equal one. So this term could be anything, it could be 3x, it could be 4x, it could be 5x, right? That coefficient isn't going to matter as long as this and this are the same. If I got rid of this two right here, then we have a problem, then we gotta do some manipulating. However, if that two is there, 
then we still have an equivalent form and it would be equal to one. And this would also be true for our special limit for cosine, except of course it would still be equal to zero, not one. So now that I've introduced you to the special trig limits, it's time to do some examples where we can use them. So first we're gonna look at the limit as x approaches zero of sine x over three x. So first we look at this and we wanna see if we can find our special limit anywhere within this limit. And right away I see I have a sine x over x, but we also have this constant of three here in the denominator. And so one of the techniques that you can do with these trig limits is to split things up so that you can analyze them better. And so the way I'm gonna split this up is I'm going to write the limit as x approaches zero, but I'm gonna pull out this constant, particularly the whole thing, so it would be one third times that sine x over x. So you notice that this is the exact same as this because if I multiply this one third by this term, we would get this term right here. So all I did was pull out that scalar multiple of one third. So then we can use our special limit property because the limit as x approaches zero for sine x over x is one and the limit as x approaches zero of a constant is whatever the constant is. And we also know that when we have limits, the limit of two functions multiplied together is equal to their limits multiplied together. So we could just say that this is equal to one third times one, which is equal to one third. So then we can also look at the example, the limit as x approaches zero of four times one minus cosine x all over x. And this is similar because if we remember, our limit as x approaches zero of one minus cosine x over x is equal to zero, but this is just some constant we can pull out. So I can rewrite this limit as x approaches zero as four times that one minus cosine x over x. And in the same way that we we're able to change this limit into one third times one, we can change this limit down here to four times the limit of this, which is zero, at least as x approaches zero. That's, that's the important thing here. And then in this case, this would just equal zero. So those are some very basic limits using those special limits we learned. So now let's look at some limits that are a little more involved. So for our next example, we have the limit as x approaches zero for sine x times the quantity one minus cosine x all over five x squared. And this one isn't quite as involved as some of the ones we're gonna look at in the future, but I do see right away, I have sine x and at least one x on the bottom, and I have one minus cosine x and another x on the bottom. Remember, you always want to be looking for those special functions, that sine x over x and one minus cosine x over x. As long as your limit is approaching zero, you can use those special limits. So I'm gonna split this up a little bit and it will help us evaluate this limit. So we're gonna say this is equal to the limit as x approaches zero of sine x and I'm gonna pull out one of the x's from the bottom here. So I'm gonna say that this is over x times, now I'm gonna write one minus cosine x, and I'm also going to take the other x. So now we've used both x's, right? We had x squared, which means we have two x's in the denominator. So I pulled both of those out. And now all we're left with, right, we used this, we used one of these x's, we used the second x, and then we also used this right here. So now all we're left with is this five. So then I write that five as one fifth because the five is in the denominator. So it would be multiplied by one fifth. So before I go any further, I wanna just stress what we did here and wanna make sure that it makes sense. We took this function and we split it up into different parts that if we multiply these together, we would still get this original function, right? We just made this its own fraction with this x on the bottom, multiplied by this term with its x on the bottom, and then multiplied by the constant of one fifth. It doesn't matter if we do that, we're still going to have the same function, but now we're able to see it in different parts and there are different parts here that we actually know the limit of as we approach zero. So now we can say that the limit is going to be equal to one times zero times one fifth, which of course anything times zero is going to be zero. So our answer here is zero. So because we know the limit as this approaches zero and we know the limit of this as x approaches zero, 
we can plug those limits in and multiply them all by then our constant. And then we can find our answer to our limit. So here's our next example. We have sine 4x over 5x. Now, remember what I said at the beginning, that this x term here needs to be the same as the x term on the bottom. In this case, it's not, right? We have 4x and 5x. So that's not really going to help us. So what we're going to have to do here is we're going to have to multiply by a form of 1 that will give us some new numbers to work with so that we can evaluate this using our special limits. So I always look at what is inside the sine function. In this case, it's 4x. So we're going to want 4x on the bottom then. We want the bottom to match up with the top. So what I'll do is I'll multiply by a form of 1, which is 4 over 4, right? 4 over 4 is 1. So we're allowed to multiply the function by that, and it ultimately won't be changed. So now that we have that, we can actually rearrange our terms, right? I could I can move this constant over here. I can move this over here. And we can rewrite this as the limit as x approaches 0 of sine 4x over 4 times x times 4 fifths. And why can I do that? Because it doesn't matter in what order you multiply these terms, you're still going to have the same function. If I were to multiply this out and this out, we would still get 4 times 5x, which would be 20x, and 4x times 5, which would also be 20x. It doesn't matter where these terms are in the denominator since they're all being multiplied by each other. We just can't move things up from the denominator to the numerator or from the top to the bottom, right? We, we can't do that. But as long as we're moving and shifting things in their respective areas, it's fine. So I moved 4 over here and I moved 5 over here. And now we have an equivalent form of the function that we can now take a limit of because this and this are the same. So we know from what I said in the beginning that as long as these two things are the same, this special limit still holds and is going to be equal to 1. So we can say that this is equal to 1 times 4 fifths, which is equal to 4 fifths. So now we're going to look at the limit as x approaches pi over 2 of sine x divided by tangent x. Now, this is a little bit different than what we've been looking at so far because we were looking at ways to use our special limits as x approaches 0. But in this case, x is approaching pi over 2, so those special limits are off the table. We can't just use them everywhere. And that's kind of why I wanted to show this example because sometimes we're just so quick to just every time I see sine, I just need to get sine x over x and then it's equal to 1. Well, you got to make sure that your x is approaching zero. If it's not, like in this case, we just have to do some trig manipulation and then we can solve it. So I haven't really shown any limits like this yet up until this point. So I figured now would be a good time to quickly show one of these because if you know how to manipulate your trig functions, these actually aren't too difficult, but you should still see at least one of these. So just like with the other limits, the first thing I always do is plug in my value of x and see what happens. But I can see right away that pi over two when plugged into tangent x is gonna get me an undefined value so this limit is already not solvable in its current state. So we're going to have to do something to it. Well, what do we know about tangent x and sine x? Well, we know that tangent x is equal to sine x divided by cosine x. So let's start with that. Let's redefine our limit with that in mind. So we'll have limit as x approaches pi over 2 of sine x divided by sine x divided by cosine x. And this would all be on the bottom denominator there. So now to simplify a little bit, we can remember that dividing by a fraction is the same as multiplying by that fraction's reciprocal. So then we would have the limit as x approaches pi over 2 is equal to sine x over 1 multiplied by cosine x over sine x. And then we can see quickly that our sine terms are going to cancel, and then we will just have cosine x left over. So we would have cosine x over 1, which is just cosine x. So let's rewrite our limit again. We'll have the limit as x approaches pi over 2 of cosine x. And now we can plug in pi over 2 because we're not going to get an indeterminate form anymore. And we'll see that cosine of pi over 2 is equal to 0. So that would be the answer for this limit. All right, for our final example, we're going to look at probably one of the toughest ones that you might come across because we have a sine function on the top and the bottom. So let's look at it here. Well, we know that we're going to want at least one thing. We're going to want sine of 8x over 8x because that's going to be equal to 1. But what do we do about this sine of 7x? Well, this leads to an interesting concept. So we're going to write a quick note here. The limit as x approaches 0 
of x over sine x is also going to be equal to one. But I'm gonna show you why, because sometimes when you go to learn this books and a lot of teachers will kind of gloss over this, but this is important to see this because we can rewrite this function as the limit as x approaches zero of one over sine x divided by x. And if you're not following that, think of like one eighth. If I wrote one over one eighth, well, what would that be equal to? How many times does one eighth go into one? Well, it goes in there eight times. So this is equal to eight, but you could also see it as one times the reciprocal of the fraction in the bottom. So in this case, it would be eight over one, which also equals eight. So just like eight could be rewritten to be one divided by one eighth, x over sine x could be rewritten to be one over sine x divided by x. So then we can say that this is equal to the limit as x approaches zero of one over the limit as x approaches zero of sine x over x. And this comes from our limit properties we learned a few lessons ago that if you have a function on the top and a function on the bottom, the limit of those two functions is each of their limits respectively divided by each other, as long as this limit isn't zero. So we can do that. We can take the limit of the top and the limit of the bottom, and we would find that this is equal to one, right? The limit as x approaches zero of a constant would always be the constant divided by, well, this is our special limit. So it's also one, so it equals one. So because of this result, not only is the limit as x approaches zero of sine x over x equal to one, but so is x over sine x, which is the reciprocal of that. So we can use that to our advantage in this problem. All right, so I cleaned up my work, and because of that note we just went over, we now know that we can also look for seven x over sine of seven x. So now we gotta figure out what we need. Well, this needs a seven x, this needs an eight x. So what we can do is multiply by several forms of one to get everything we need. So let's do that. I'm gonna rewrite this as the limit as x approaches zero of sine eight x over sine of seven x. And we're gonna multiply this by the forms of one of the things we need. So for starters, we're going to need an x on the bottom and on the top. So that makes things pretty easy. Let's multiply by this form of one, x over x. Then we know that we need an eight on the denominator. So we'll multiply by eight over eight. Remember, it has to be a form of one. You can't multiply by one eight. You gotta multiply by eight over eight. And then we also know that we need a seven in the numerator. So once again, don't multiply by just seven, multiply by seven over seven. So now we have everything we need. We can rearrange and we can find the value of this limit. So let's do that. We'll have the limit as x approaches zero, and now we're gonna rearrange things a little bit. So I'm gonna start by taking sine of eight x and x and eight. So I'm gonna rewrite that as sine of eight x over eight x. And I should be a little more clear. These, I'm not canceling things out. I'm just crossing them out to show you what I've already used. So then we can use our next terms. I'm going to use sine of seven x, seven and x. And that's gonna be multiplied by that. So I'm gonna write 7x over sine of 7x, right? Because this seven came from here, this x came from here, and this came from over here. Just like this came from here, and this eight came from here, and this x came from down here. And then we just have to multiply by what we're left with, which in this case is eight and seven. So we can write eight over seven, and then we've used all of our terms. So then we can simplify this and get our limit. So we know that this is a special limit that's going to be equal to one. We also know that this is a special limit equal to one. And then we just have eight sevenths. So it's one times one times eight sevenths, which is equal to eight sevenths. All right, so that's all you need to know about evaluating limits of trig functions. Certainly there are more like that one we looked at where we had x approaching pi over two, but as long as you know your different trig identities, they're actually not too difficult to do in most cases. But if you have any questions, feel free to put those in the comments. If you wanna see some more examples of trig functions in limits, you can click on the example video at the end, or I'll also have it linked in the description. But until then, I'll see you next time.